Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, the Barry Whistler Gallery, the Ioannis Project, and the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History for making all of this happen and making all of it possible. Um, uh, on a personal note, I remember a few years ago walking into the Wilcox space for the first time, thanks to Rick Bertel and Pierrette Lacour, and saying, wow, this is, this is really something, this is really special. Um, little did I know at the time what was going to happen over the next few years, um, but I think we all know what a special artist John Wilcox was and, and what a special place that was. Um, our panel today is uh, Barry Whistler of Barry Whistler Gallery, uh, Dr. Sarah Kozlowski of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History, David Wilcox of the Ioannis Project, um, and I'm Ben Lima, editor of the Athenaeum Review, which is a journal of the Edith O'Donnell <laughs> Institute of Art History, uh, which has a great artwork on the cover and an excellent article by Dr. Kozlowski on the work of John Wilcox in the back. And copies are available at the front for anyone who's interested. Um, and um, today we're going to talk about a few aspects of John Wilcox's work and also invite comments and questions from many of you all who I know some know uh, John Wilcox and his work very well. So one of the things that we're celebrating today is the publication of a gorgeous six-volume set of exhibition catalogs, each of which represents a different aspect of John Wilcox's work, and each of which represents untold hours of labor going into its exhibition, which took place at the Wilcox space in Exposition Park. How has working on these catalogs over the last several years affected your view of John's work? I'll go first. Um, you know, this this whole project since John passed away in 2012 has been uh, enormously organic. No one set out and said, oh, we're going to do a six-volume set, we're going to do a documentary, we're going to do an archive. And I think Rick was driving this vision of let's take a look at local Texas artists who were significant. And the Wilcox space offered an opportunity to really dig deep into John's work. Um, and I will be frank with you, we did not know what the exhibits would be. We knew that Barry would do one, Rick wanted to do one, you all did one, but other than that, it just kind of grew. And I think uh, what I learned about my brother from doing the project um, was I just learned all sorts of things about him and his work. And a lot of that I could not have learned without the help of these wonderful friends of the Wilcox space, like Ben, Sarah, Rick, Barry, um, who helped us make that happen. So it was, it was a deep dive, and fortunately my lung capacity was pretty stout. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that I had been showing John's work for quite a while, but uh, seeing the, the book put, put together, the six volume set, provided an opportunity to see specific periods. Um, just everybody did a great job. Rick Bertel focused on the California work. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, John was out there in California, he was working, and you know, he might have shown me a few pieces, but uh, to see it put together, you know, now in this whole, so the whole body, you know, really had an impact. And mm -hmm. uh, the exhibition kind of jumps around a bit with some highlights, if you will, but uh, um, it's that's that was kind of my take. Just. It's an amazing set. I mean, we, you know, the flyers that we've sent out about the, the six volume were just like, oh my gosh, I have to have one of those. We're, we're holding one for you. So, you know. <laughs> no, I think you're right there that um, you know it documented each each volume documented um, uh, an exhibition, but it also tried to make sense of all of that um, yeah. chronologically in terms of the arc of the career, the kind of um, themes, concerns, artistic stakes, and um, took a kind of art historical point of view mm -hmm. that um, was useful. And, and I think will help frame, and it's certainly not definitive, <laughs> um, but I think it will help frame and be a launch pad for, for future work. Yeah. 
I've had the experience so many times of, you know, wh whether it's like, let's say for a, for an exhibition review or something, I mean, can you sum up what an artist is doing in 800 words or 500 words or something? And having the pleasure of working on this project really made me appreciate how when an artist's work is really rich and you have the opportunity to really, really get into it in that way, it's, it's, it's just a really special thing. So, um, can I add one thing to that too? Um, I know the question was about the catalogs, but you know they went along with these installations at the Wilcox space, and um, I always felt a little bit like a um, um, an interloper because I work on really old stuff, um, and here I am working on uh, uh, like you know, before 1950. Right, <laughs> <laughs> before 1450, and um, and what was so moving and really transformative for me was to to be involved in a project and to see a project come together that was based, yes, on kind of intellectual interest and, and wanting to understand a body of work, but also um, really about friendship. Um, friendships that John had and then friendships that kind of formed around and because of him. Um, and that's been really, that's been such a gift. Mm. Um, that that kind of work can can happen um, in, in that kind of context. It's not to be taken for granted in our yeah. field. And not an easy guy to get to know. Yeah. Right, David? Yeah. I mean, you're a brother, but yeah. still. He was very shy, very quiet. I He would often call me before Barry would have a show and say, do I really need to go to the opening? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we've been able to get him out of his shell a little bit. Yeah. Well, so um, Sarah Reyes and Daniel Dransky of Extraordinary have made an award-winning movie entitled John Wilcox, The Relinquishment of Time. And there's more info about that on the front if anyone is curious. Um, what was your reaction to this movie when you saw it finished? I, I thought it was wonderful. I mean, just David's, David's part alone with getting to know, you know, as a brother and his take on it and even things about their youth. Um, and then... Uh, the, the, the conservation work, which unfortunately the conservator that worked on uh, Crucifix was not able to be here today. We had invited her, uh, Laura Hartman. You know, and, uh, but, I mean, all aspects, uh, it's, it's a nice link. You know, we watched it, we watched it home, we watched it in other places too, and it was good. And then just a couple of weeks ago, a conversation with Sarah and Daniel just allowed me to sort of get to know them better, you know, after having seen their work. And I just told Allison, I said, they're amazing. You know, these are great folks and they're more than worthy of having, you know, been involved in this project as an integral part of it. So. I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing I've felt about the film, and I didn't really want to be part of it, but I had to be. Um, <clears throat> In my profession as a psychologist, I, it's all about hearing people tell stories. And there's no one story that captures a historical event. There are many stories. And so I think that the beauty of working with Daniel and Sarah on the film was certainly we've told a story with the Wilcox space and the archives and the books but having another crack at it through their eyes was just, to me, very moving. So thank you. I was thinking, you know, when I, when I got to see the movie, how, um, how uh, I, I, I guess just hearing from so many of the different individuals who had their own kind of take or own experience with the work, um, I'm, I'm not sure I have the right metaphor, but kind of adding all those, adding all those things together was it, it just woven together. Woven yeah. together. It was so thought provoking. Um, well, one of the things that we're uh, celebrating is that um, after again many years of work, there's there's a full archive and database of John Wilcox's work, which will now have a home at the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History at UT Dallas, um, and uh, this is for David, but for others as well. Could you talk about the work of compiling this archive and database, and then also uh, for Sarah and, and Barry, and, you know, and what role that will play going forward? 
All Just right. sum it all up. So imagine, <laughs> um, honesty, imagine you go to Goodwill and you pick up a puzzle, um, and you hope that the image on the box is what the pieces tell in the box. <laughs> um, so it's been a 10-year process of, you know, just having this massive amount of uh, paper, drawings, notebooks, ephemera, and then trying to make sense of it. So when you start out, you're not making any sense of it. You're just, you're just trying to see what is where. And then I think finally, in the last six to eight months, it's reached this maturity where all the pieces fit together. And um, it's been it's been really fun. I mean, you know, I I feel very blessed to be able to do this. And it, as I told Michael Thomas the other day, you know, I probably could have had a second job at a post office putting letters in <laughs> slots because I really like to do things like that. Well, I'll say, I mean, from the point of view of, um, of this being a kind of body of material that one can dive into as an art historian or a student, it's just an oyster. I mean, David has done an incredible, incredible job. And I, I, I'm relatively familiar with a whole range of artists archives and each of the different beasts um, but um, this beast is going to be one that, that will be amazing to play with <laughs> really and, um, so it so let's see what it is so the archive is is um, material related to the, the material archive is is material related to the, the career the paintings um, everything from photographs ephemera drawings yeah. sketches artists books um, preparatory um, calculations right. in some cases, uh, materials related to exhibitions, um, records of sale, all, all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, and then the database wrangles all of that, brings all of that together with a, uh, you know, with an archival number in different categories, along with the paintings that yeah. still survive. Um, uh, and uh, well, most of them survive in, in my kind of 14th century mood. Yes, along with the paintings, they are here. Um, and and it's also it's organized in different categories. It's numbered. Um, it's on a platform called um, Devon Think, which is all uh, it's it's uh, illustrated with great photography. Um, it's all hyperlinked, so you can go to one um, entry for this uh, canvas, for example and then use a hyperlink to different objects in the Phoenix series, along with mm -hmm. um, different materials related to their exhibition history, um, sometimes the painting materials that yeah, John right. used, David has found and photographed and, and inventory. Um, and so all of this is hyperlinked and really easily searchable. So um, it's just, you know, it's it's a, as I said, it's an oyster that, that's waiting to be um, uh, used by, by researchers and students and fellow artists, and we're just thrilled. Okay. Uh, I think a lot more work is going to grow out of it. Good. That's great. I think about two months ago, David called me and said, well, Barry, I think I've finished the archive. And I said, I thought, he's not kidding. He really has been working on it solidly all this time. And just as a little glimpse for everyone that's here today, the wall labels that we have on two pieces, bluing, and crucifix are just a little snippet of the stories that David would put forth in this archive and uh, personal stories about John and I travel. We did this, we did that. Um, I think it's just it it makes it all much more real and alive. Yeah. And so rich. I mean, bluing, for example, you know, David recounts. So each entry, you know, is everything from dimensions, condition, current location, exhibition yeah. history, yeah. Um, all the kinds of things that you would that you would expect to see in, in, in an archive or mm -hmm. catalog. But then things like, well, why is it called bluing? And the you know the relation yeah. to um, to the bluing the laundry. Yeah, um, the laundry whitener. So w we grew up in in. Denison, about 80 miles north of here, and it was in the country, and we invariably would wander into a wasp nest or something like that and get stung. So 
my grandmother had this, I've forgotten the actual name of the lady, but it was this bottle of bluing, which is a chemical compound that is rich in iron. Um, and she would put it on our wasp bites and help bring the swelling down. And John did this work not long after he was diagnosed HIV positive. And so he did tell me about it when he was doing it and about the strings and everything. But then when I found out what the title was, I realized it's about the wish for a salve or a remedy to something that is very uh, harmful. And so those little anecdotes find their way into the archive, probably more than most people would want to know. Um, it's, we want to know everything. No, really, it's all, it's True all, art historian. It's all Christmas for the middle. It's all yeah, it is, yeah. Um, and we have a little, on the laptop back there, we have a little a presentation of the archive. Um, so you can kind of see where, you know, if you have an hour and you want, you don't want to stream Netflix, you can go on the archive and deep dive into all sorts of things. So it's fun. I'll just say, as as a as someone who's worked in the field of art history on on contemporary art, you know, you you do sometimes hear people say, "Well, contemporary art is that is that really history? Like, is that history? It's not really history, is it?" But when you um, Got when there. <laughs> yes. But but something something like this, you you can look at it and and you you know you realize like this this is how history you know this is how history is made. These are documents. These are sources. These are you know stories. stories. And um, and you know the moment that an individual passes, um, like there's they can't answer your questions anymore. You can't kind of check with them about things. You have the sources and you have the documents and it's the beginning of history. And I it, it's I think it's really it's really important. Yeah. Barry alluded to this, but uh, in this section,